interesting title. Um, I should let you know that I'm coming from this, um, coming to this from rather an interesting perspective. Um, this photo is of me and my uh, master musician. This is me as an apprentice and James Kelly, um, an Irish fiddle player who's fairly well known uh, and comes from a long legacy of traditional musicians. Um, and this is about 10 years ago. And since the time of my apprenticeship, um, my understanding of musical knowledge really shifted. Um, the way in which um, knowledge was given to me during this uh, apprenticeship time um, really allowed me to question a lot of uh, things that later on I uh, I, I kept hearing with regard to you know, music information and um, even the concept of documents and one might say bibliocentrism. Um, uh, and so this is where um, a lot of my examples and perspective will be coming from. Uh, it's my time with James Kelly uh, and my understanding of Irish traditional music. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about some of the ways um, that uh, this uh, information came to me, um, making a bit of an argument for memory, metaphor, and storytelling together, slightly different, but um, also collectively together as alternative types of documents, and what that might mean since they're a little bit more problematic, um, less tangible um, types of documents, and then the issue of trust and openness uh, with regard to a sensitive, possibly secret, um, you're not sure if it's supposed to be secret or not, uh, information and, and how that might influence what is formally known and then informally sort of on the street known. Um, oops, excuse me. And then the uh, last uh, bit is just touching on um, two concepts on uh, how we can attribute things to certain um, to certain people or not, and then the idea of relationships between um, music information. So just, a, just two aspects. Each of these could easily be its own paper, so um, I apologize if I go too far into one and don't leave room for another, but I'll try to get through. Um, so the first one is, is briefly looking at what is a long and complicated history of what a document is and uh, who's defining it. Um, but just to start with Brie, she gives some definitions and her preferred one is actually the second, uh, but they all deal with proof, the idea of proof or evidence um, to support knowledge claims. And Turner's work in oral information is rather fascinating. Her, um, her, uh, her work deals with, um, from, it's based on Froman's informativeness of documents to sort of legitimize oral information, orally based information as, um, as a, just a different landscape, not necessarily uh, any less formal or authoritative. Um, and so I did a little bit of a comparison here with um, just to set up what I'm, I'm going to talk about each of the three, the memory, met metaphor, and storytelling. Um, so the four informative, the four properties of documents that uh, Froman um, talked about would give it informativeness were um, historicity. So this is the way in which um, the, the sort of the legacy of, of accessing um, the document. And so Turner gives examples for oral documents. So she's looking at ways of accessing speeches, um, how that has changed expectations of transcript versus seeing just another uh, recreation of it. Um, and for my example, I was thinking of how um, uh, human beings can be seen as you know, types of repositories. So details within these documents, if these are stories being retold or the types of metaphors, they, the details may change, um, but the concept is the same, the, the moral, if you will, what it's supposed to convey is very <coughs> similar. Um, such as um, when I was studying Irish music, um, James would tell me things that his father told him or that he learned from 
uh, other people and the way in which they would phrase something and he would give it yet another spin and another um, explanation according to his musical life and what made sense to him. Um, and sometimes these would be definitely more contemporary with the details, but essentially the same. And the institutionalization, um, the norms and processes that would um, perpetuate this context of the document. And so that context could be you know, how it's shared, even within a traditional realm. Um, materiality, and this isn't necessarily tangibility, but it could, it could be seen in a more traditional sense of document as tangibility, um, but then it, it plays into the idea of, of weight and um, the significance of what it contains. So with traditional uh, music knowledge, typically um, these types of documents have it not, not necessarily technical information about the music, but very contextual philosophical elements um, to orient the person towards a certain approach or understanding um, of musical concepts and extra musical concepts. And in ter terms of social discipline, this is more or less a, a, the, the authority that, um, uh, in the case of oral information, the speaker's weight uh, the, an authority, I should say. Um, and from the uh, traditional music uh, document's perspective, um, this could be whether the person um, giving this information is considered an authority figure um, a practitioner, someone who's very um, informed about these sorts of cultural contexts and norms. And so in terms of uh, making the case for why indigenous knowledge may be different, and there are so many places where you can, um, you could draw upon uh, quotations. Um, Archie Dick's quote um, pits Popper against um, indigenous knowledge that you know sometimes the landscape is just different and what you may think of as as being useful for for you know um, storing information um, you know when dealing with a lot of master traditional musicians especially with uh, James you know he he stored this all up here and in fact when I then convey a lot of this information to my students um, I, I teach the Irish Ensemble at Florida State, and um, so I'm oftentimes met with the task of, of trying to convey um, complicated concepts to people who are in a completely different cultural space and have a different music background. Um, and so, you know, it, you're constantly negotiating between, um, between those two worlds. And so, Turner talks a little bit about memory in, in oral information, mainly uh, from a uh, social point of view is, is where she, um, uh, she looks. And so she discusses social memory and uh, you know, the idea that your memories can of course be transferred and you know, how that happens, um, it, you, have to, you have to have some sort of tangibility so you have to speak or convey that memory and then of course it can be taken on by others. Um, so metaphors were used quite often in my training, and this isn't unique necessarily to Irish music, um, but there were overarching concepts um, and stories that sometimes the stories and the metaphors were, um, were more closely related. Uh, in a way, you could look at metaphors as being documents that convey these you know, intangible aspects of culture, um, context and philosophy. The four example, well, four and then and the last one are sort of variants on the same uh, that James used often was, was the idea of harvesting emotion, you're harvesting. So you're taking aspects from one master musician's approach and you're trying to harvest their cognitive products and somehow infuse that in your brain and what you're doing and outputting you and them and all of these. So your product is very different from 
um, just your product. It's not yours to own necessarily. And also the concepts of soul and soulfulness, um, which had a slightly different uh, application um, between soulful sounds, non-soulful sounds, what that means. Essences of tunes are characters, masks, and hats. So we have to switch back between um, presenting various uh, character elements of the music. And it's really impossible to give depth um, to these concepts without uh, talking a lot about each of them. Um, this is just a snapshot of some examples. And usually the, um, usually the uh, examples were put in a context of um, you know, trying to be instructive and convey um, the approach that was supposed to be taken. Um, so, uh, we're all a work in progress, uh, being on a journey, on a path, um, peaks and valleys, your musical life is peaks and valleys, you can't be stuck in the valley, you can't be up on the peak, you know, what does that mean? Um, you're trying to translate that, that knowledge um, into, into what you do. So these are some examples, just two of many, many, um, and uh, so Ave was very interested in tangibility, um, but he does talk about, um, uh, with regard, uh, regarding written documents, that if they have a certain structure, if they um, have notions and ideas that you know, have this type of progressive structure and logical construction, um, and stories do, you know, they may not be written down yet, um, but with oral history and all these other um, aspects of, of oral knowledge, um, we, we do sort of view um, storytelling as legitimate ways of sharing information. Um, but I thought that was interesting. He legitimized something, I'm not sure he wanted to, but I don't know, um, can't ask him anymore. Um, so trust and openness. This, um, so the things that I was told, um, and, and this is where it gets tricky, um, telling it to all of you, um, you know, it, it took me a while to earn the privilege to hear some of these things that he knew. And as a teacher now, I don't give away these same things just freely. I wait until people get to a certain point where that maybe um, philosophically they'll be more open to these ideas or um, just simply they have enough skills to actually make sense of it all. So access to knowledge depends a lot upon relationship and, um, and trust and how, um, how respectful you are with this knowledge. Um, the, second, the second point here, the soul of the Ambera, is rather a um, classic story in ethnomusicology uh, of the scholar Paul Berliner and his work with the Shona, Shona people. Um, and he was very interested in the Mbira, which um, sometimes is called the thumb piano, but it's more complex than that. Uh, so the Mbira is, uh, he, he went to um, study this music in its context and was in a village um, for several years before um, the master musician in this village uh, felt like sharing the complex and um, just really detailed, uh, uh, complicated um, structure of, of, you know, um, of how the Embera music um, scales. It just the, the entire philosophy of playing this instrument um, and the music surrounding it, uh, he eventually gained enough trust to, um, to access that information after being tricked several times and being given the wrong stuff and you would cross check and it wasn't right. Um, and so eventually uh, the master musician lays it all out for him. And so then, um, and, and this is what you do um, at, that, at that time, it was not uncommon for ethnomusicologists to go and work in, in the field for quite a long period of time. Uh, and then his book that he published called The Soul of the Embira gives all these detailed charts and gives it all out there for anyone with no um, contextual um, knowledge, perhaps, 
um, no, they've, they've not had to work for this. And so it raises an ethical concern. Um, we want to be open and free with knowledge. We want to make sure we're accurate and also humane. Um, but was it really his to give? And of course, um, you know, that's, uh, I'm not here to condemn or condone him. Um, but just, it's a great example. Thank you. Um, so another example is one where I was um, uh, talking with a friend who um, is involved with um, African diasporic um, religious music. And she uh, has been involved in this community for a long time. And her, um, her reaction when talking about these struggles between um, you know, expectations of secrecy and the, the desire to um, disseminate knowledge and, and make it um, tangible, uh, printed in a book or, or shared in another way. Um, she said, well, maybe I don't want to tell you what goes on behind the curtain. Maybe I shouldn't have to tell you that. So she can know, but she's had to work for it. Um, and so within the master and the apprentice frame, um, again, there are levels of, of openness, and there's not always necessarily appropriate evidence that can be shared. Um, for instance, um, I want to make sure I don't forget some of these examples. Um, so, um, the, uh, for instance, the um, and this will come back with the attribution um, discussion, uh, attributing something to a composer or not, uh, is just, you know, for instance, there's um, one very famous band that um, made a recording of a very famous tune, but the recording of the tune um, was incorrect. And, and um, James told me in confidence that um, that this tune hadn't been played before he himself played it on um, the radio in Ireland, and uh, that it was must have been picked up by a member of this very, very popular group. And um, the shape of the tune was completely changed, and it was changed from a jig to a slide, which I know it doesn't mean much um, to all of you, but it, it totally changed the shape of the tune. And so that popular version made popular by the band is now what everyone views that particular piece of music to be. And so if you, if you say, well, I, I, I know for a fact that it's actually a jig, and, and I know the person who played it on the radio, he only got it from an obscure archival recording. I can't prove it, you know? Um, so and I'm not going to name the band because, again, you know, struggles. Um, so another, um, there are so many examples that I could give, and I don't want to, um, overstep my time, but uh, for instance, there are there's not always a universal understanding and uh, viewpoint about what composition means and ownership of of, um, of a product. So um, this is just one example. Plains and Flathead uh, tribes are inspired, and they don't necessarily that is in the in a traditional viewpoint um, are inspired to compose. These are uh, results of visions um, and not necessarily a uh, result of, of a human intent. You know, I wrote that note there. This is my work. Um, regarding the second point, John Kelly Sr. is James's father. And he uh, gave a tune to a tune collector, rather famous um, person by the name of Seamus Ennis, who worked for Radio Aaron. And Seamus Ennis was going around, his job was to collect all sorts of music from the countryside. And uh, John Kelly Sr., being a very prominent musician, was the target of these collecting efforts. Um, and he passed one of his own compositions off as traditional because he wanted it to be included. He didn't want it to be thrown out. So he said, you know, oh, this, here's this tune. It's called Elizabeth Kelly's Delight. Um, it's traditional. I heard my mother playing it. And it's named after his own mother. And so I was told um, by James that you know it's it's a well-known family uh, understanding that um, it was actually his father's composition, and it's just not written anywhere. No one's attributing this to him because 
it's kind of being kept in the family respectfully because he didn't want it to get out and, and they're sort of concerned that it would, um, you know, they have, they have their own concerns about um, really putting that down in writing, if you will. Um, so there are other problems with composition such as um, a particular tune here that came from a song um, that was actually partially composed by a group, not an individual. Um, and so, you know, how does one, how does one exactly um, attribute that? Relationships, um, there's definitely a, a um, complicated relationship between when something is new versus a variant and um, sometimes variants, what would be seen as variations are actually seen as the same in Irish music. Um, there's a whole tradition of replacing sections of, of um, music with, um, uh, with variation that then becomes known as a certain person's version, but it is in fact known also as that same tune. Um, so I guess all of the things that I, I've given as examples um, come down to sort of an ethical um, question about evidence, what kinds of evidence and therefore documents um, are acceptable to justify knowledge and um, how does that influence um, what we're able to do with some of these more problematic areas. So when um, it's problematic to disclose um, the piece of, of information, you know, when it can't really be proved or proving becomes an ethical dilemma. Um, and, you know, these intangible aspects of cultural knowledge that aren't necessarily able to be well represented within current structures. So it's all um, affected by um, evidence, I think, uh, with regard to indigenous um, knowledge and, and traditional music, just as an example um, of these types of, of issues. Thank you.